Today, we hear of the final sign of Jesus' earthly ministry in the Gospel of John. I know the season of Lent has just begun, and it may feel way too soon for this story to feel like it's drawing to a close. But the story we've just heard today is the catalyst for the plot to kill Jesus. The leaders worry amongst themselves. If he can raise the dead, then everyone will believe in him. If they do, then Rome will fall on us. He must die. Over the coming weeks of Lent, we'll walk side by side with Jesus and his followers through his final days and hours, hear his parting words and witness with them to his death. So we, who know the end of this story, are gifted with an opportunity to grieve the death of Jesus before it happens, as Jesus grieves the death of his friend. Grief is a complicated thing. There are endless metaphors for trying to comprehend this complex feeling. Grief is like a wave against a shore. It ebbs and it flows. Some days it is stormy and overwhelming us. Some days it's like a gentle, familiar rocking. Yet through it all, we learn to swim again and again. Grief is like a ball in a box, and that ball presses a button in the box that causes us pain each time it's pressed. Early on in grief, it hits the button every second of the day, and the pain is constant. It's a large ball in a small box. But through time and care and grace, either we learn to grow the box or the ball becomes small. The button gets pressed every now and then, but it's less, even as the ball of grief is always present. Grief is like a stack of boxes that we're carrying in our arms, like we're moving into a new home. We can't really see the home around us when we're struggling to carry the boxes, so life seems to only be these grief-stricken boxes. Yet we find the people over time who will help us carry them, or even find the places of safety and rest to set them down from time to time to see the world anew. I, as you know, am a big nerd, and so I'm particularly drawn to a definition of grief that was presented by Marvel Studios last year in their show WandaVision where the vision is speaking with a grieving Wanda Maximoff after the death of her brother. He hears her pain, but asks, it can't all be sorrow, can it? Discussing with her what it means to lose one we love, Vision finally says, what is grief if not love persevering? In a similar way, actor Andrew Garfield was being interviewed on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, where he explained how his role as the Rent composer Jonathan Larson in the film Tick, Tick, Boom helped him to process the grief he experienced after losing his mother to pancreatic cancer in 2019. Tearing up, Garfield said, I love talking about her, by the way. So if I cry, it's only a beautiful thing. This is all the unexpressed love the grief that will remain with us until we pass because we never get enough time with each other no matter if someone lives till 60, till 15, or 99. So I hope this grief stays with me because it's all the unexpressed love that I didn't get to tell her and I told her every day. Grief is a part of the human experience because death is a part of of life. I believe that at its heart, grief is love enduring. Yet that perspective on the nature of grief is so often clouded by the pain it causes. And it is love and pain that draws Jesus back to Bethany to attend to those he loves. Lazarus is dying. And while we don't know the full backstory of why Lazarus, Mary, and Martha are so dear to Jesus, we just know that he loves them. 
by the time Jesus finally arrives, Lazarus has been dead for four days. In the ancient world, there was a belief that the soul lingered near the body for a time. But after four days, the soul was definitely gone. Lazarus was deader than dead. The grief was deep, the pain profound, and the confrontation between Martha and Jesus and then Mary and Jesus, these are heartbreaking. But in the conversations with Martha and Mary, Jesus turns his traditional order around that we find in the Gospel of John. Usually the discourse and explanation follows the miraculous signs. But this time, he explains what he's about to do to his beloved friends before it happens. In his explanation to Martha, Jesus offers this familiar statement. I am the resurrection and the life. He says this because in the conversation, Martha admits that she believes in a final resurrection that Jesus promises at at the end of time, but shows that this promise does nothing for the profound grief that she knows right now in this moment. To see the resurrection as only a future event is a mistake. In the words of Dr. Caroline Lewis, to anticipate and locate the promises of the resurrection only in a future life with God is counterintuitive to the fourth gospel. This is why Jesus must interpret the final sign before it actually happens, lest persons even as close to him as Martha maintain only one mindset for what resurrection can mean. This gospel wants us to know that another way to imagine the resurrection is to make it synonymous with life here and now. Jesus' revelation that he is the resurrection and the life upends any and all expectations of our future lives as heaven or hell, some sort of -of get-out-of-jail-free card, or postponed grace. Rather, the consequences of this final sign for the fourth gospel are that resurrection lays claim on our lives today. Resurrection in the future? Yes. Resurrection here and now. Also, yes. We have to this point witnessed the miraculous signs of Jesus, turning water into wine at Cana, healing the official son, healing the paralytic, feeding the 5,000, walking on water, healing the man born blind, and now. The final sign. The raising of Lazarus, who is deader than dead. No healing, no resuscitation. Life where there is only death is what's needed now. But that is precisely what the entirety of Jesus' ministry has been pointing to. Just in case we've missed the point, before the final confrontation in Jerusalem, Jesus wants to make sure that his followers know what his way is all about. The final sign is the final nail pulled out of the coffin to show us that resurrection life is lived here and now. But even before this sign can come to be, Jesus is confronted with the grief of Mary. He's confronted with Mary's persevering and living love for her brother. And Christ recalls his own love for Lazarus. And Jesus weeps. Looking at the world around us, with war and loss and pandemic and pain and fear and uncertainty, frankly, I need a God who weeps. I need a God who doesn't just say, oh, it's okay, all things happen for a reason, just, just wait around for the next good thing. Yes, a miracle follows. But just as new hope and resurrection life are known all around us in countless ways, first, there is grief. Our God does not say that our feelings are trivial or irrelevant. Jesus weeps for his friend and for the painful ways that death separates us from one another. The threads of life are cut and life feels unraveled. 
God knows this pain too, and death grieves the heart of God. Only after grieving does Christ show us that God has the power to overcome even the power of death. Those tears of a persevering and living love were needed before the words of eternal love were spoken. Lazarus, come out. The voice of love cries out, and Lazarus is once again woven into the fabric of not just the future resurrection, but of life here and now. Unbound from his grave clothes, persevering love, living love, eternal love weaves Lazarus back into the body. And in this sign, it is revealed to us that even death is not the power we once thought it was. Love weaves us together with all people, even with those who have died in the faith. Where there is pain, where there is death, where there is separation, God grieves with us and hurts with us. God sits with us in the pain and the stench of death and holds our grief until we are able to see that grief is simply love persevering, love living, love eternal. Resurrection is not some far-off event. It's not some historical feat 2,000 years ago. It is the ever-present hope of those who trust in the Lord. The one who is the resurrection and the life bids us to see that resurrection is here and happening now. Where there is hopelessness and pain, where there seems to be only death, God's love is persevering living and eternally transforming this brokenness to new life. I know that our Lenten journey makes it seem like we can't talk about resurrection until Easter. But make no mistake, that's what this journey is all about. The word Lent comes from the old English word lengthen, which means springtime, where the days began to lengthen. This is a season for planting and growing. It's a season for untangling and weaving. It's a season where hope and pain are planted together deep in the soil, and our abiding trust and hope is that the work of resurrection that leads to blooming is already at work in ways unseen. It's a season for honoring our pain and brokenness, grieving where we need to grieve, and trusting that God is with us in the midst of this. And God gives the growth that will burst forth in new life. Lazarus, come out. Church, come out. Child of God, come out. The voice of love is calling to you. Wherever we are bound by death and fear, we are called to trust not just in a future resurrection, but in abundant life that unfolds here and now. Love persevering. Love living. Love eternal. This love is a promise for today, and this love is what weaves us together in hope and grace. Amen.